I think it only came to us, but in the chat, someone mentioned they were having audio issues. Um, so I will just say if, if anyone does have to disconnect or anything, uh, we're recording this. You can always uh, right. uh, catch it on online um, in a little yeah. bit. Uh, I'm not going to repeat my introduction. <laughs> They'll just have to live without it. Um, Let's see. So I'm going to uh, uh, start promptly. If, if there's one thing I do a terrible job at, it's, it's sticking to um, uh, my schedule when I do these, these talks. I'm going to get distracted already. I, uh, as Bill is just sharing what an awesome migration it's been, um, especially the last couple of days, I wanted to make sure if there's, uh, if there's one thing you take away from tonight's talk, it should be this great resource, which is BirdCast. Birdcast.info is the website. Um, one of the coolest things on it are, are they'll basically use weather radar, next rad radar information to forecast uh, bird migration. So predicting tonight that there will be 80 million birds uh, moving across the, the lower 48 states. Um, it's gonna drop down a little bit. You can see we're gonna have some precipitation in a couple of nights. So uh maybe save your um save your sick days don't go birding uh quite yet and then the fun one this is just looking at here was last night so you'll see that's sunset showing as the red bar moves across and now watch the number of uh birds in flight so this is you know 2 a.m 200 million birds passing over uh and then here's sunrise uh, this morning as, as birds are now landing. So anyways, birdcast.info um, does just an amazing job uh, helping us kind of predict some of the uh, movements of birds and um, certainly helps me be a better birder uh, in the spring or at least know uh, which days are worth heading out birding. Um, every day is worth going out, I should say. But uh, so this is a fun talk. This is one um, uh, I originally put together uh, years ago when I first started working for Maine Audubon. I've, I've always been kind of interested in uh, these changes. You know, uh, 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 birds are kind of a wonderful way for us to kind of monitor what's going on. Um, they tend to be a lot easier to to keep track of than a, a lot of other um, things like, you know, be it insects or mammals are, are quite challenging. Um, uh, so I've done this in, a number of times, but I actually completely redid these slides just, just today. So th this is gonna be a fun one. I, I picked a few kind of more, what I'll just call relevant highlights, but we're gonna look over essentially the past hundred years. I'll, I'll point out a few different resources that we use and. Um, uh, show you what some of the changes are. And then uh, I do hope, um, I hope to stick to the schedule and then uh, be able to hang on for, for some questions at the end. So we'll dive right in. I think I, I have to put this slide in, contractually obligated to. Um, I know a lot of people, you know, find themselves associated with Maine Audubon in different ways, but I do just like to make sure everyone is aware that we are the statewide organization. We really, um, appreciate and depend on our chapters that work, you know, especially at this local level um, and, and very thankful for all the, the programs, you know, especially these still being able to do things on Zoom uh, for now, but um, certainly bird walks and things like that will be, be starting up. But good to know that as a, you know, chapter member, you're still a part of Maine Audubon. Um, doing our mission to conserve Maine's wildlife and wildlife habitats. As we always say, a uh, uh, tripod is the most sturdy object. Any birders should know that with their, uh, what they wanna put their scope on. And so uh, a tripod, you know, the, the tripod of Maine Audubon, the three legs that it stands on would be education, conservation, and advocacy. So I, as the staff naturalist work in our education department, which is why I get to, um, do things like be here and, and present to, to groups. Um, I wanted to make a, a, a special a, a call out, especially for some of our conservation work that's going on. I'll, I'll highlight some of it in tonight's talk. Um, 
but especially for uh, Laura Zitsky, who's on the that middle picture here. Hopefully you can see my cursor, but um, right now I know she is incredibly busy out on Maine's sandy beaches uh, uh, doing work to help our piping plovers, which again, we'll talk about in a little bit, but it's, it's setting up um, things like those uh, exclosures that you can see, putting those around nests to keep predators and people away. Um, it's really important work. And then of course our, our advocacy, I'll always make a plug for, you can sign up for Maine Audubon's action alerts and, and learn about ways that you can kind of uh, be involved on the, the advocacy side. Um, and again, all the work that we do uh, is really thanks to our membership. We are a member-based organization. So uh, hopefully you're already either Maine Audubon or, or York County Audubon member, fall under the same umbrella. Uh, but if not, please consider joining and uh, trying to support the work we do. I wanted to start by mentioning some of my favorite resources. Um, see if this video plays. Uh, to go back, um, Birds of Maine by Aura Knight, 1908, this uh, wonderful old relic. Uh, I think they only did uh, uh, 500 copies the, the first printing. Um, and it's remarkable what Knight was able to do, um, especially for that time frame, um, doing a great job kind of breaking down different species uh, all around the state uh, and really breaking them down by county and saying kind of where they were, how uh, essentially what their populations were like. Uh, what is it, 40 or so years later, 1949, Ralph Palmer wrote, uh, Maine birds, which was a great update to uh, tonight's birds of Maine. Um, Palmer was kind of more of a hunter. I feel like you could you could tell there was a little more emphasis on some of the the game birds and things. Um, that's the rough grouse on the on the cover. Um, but we are very fortunate, uh, even a year ago, this would be a different talk because we now have uh, Peter Vickery's Birds of Maine. Um, sorry, this is some video I shot for a, a unboxing video I, I did last year, but um, an absolutely beautiful thing. Unfortunately, Peter Vickery uh, passed away before the completion of the book. So we have people to think like his wife, Barbara Vickery, uh, and Scott Wiedensall took over as the managing editors, but then Charles Duncan, Bill Sheehan, and, and Jeff Wells um, stepped in to kind of help finish writing these, these species accounts. And I'll strongly encourage, like, uh, I'm sure in the Q&A, um, we're probably just going to have lots of questions about, you know, well, what about this species? What about this species? Um, and I'll answer as many as I can, uh, but this is kind of the value of this book. Um, you can see the, the opening chapter is kind of about talk about conservation work and, and some of the changes here in Maine. Um, and then beyond that, as we'll get into in a second, as I keep flipping, there are actually these species accounts. So good to know this is not a field guide. It's not uh, going to be good for you know helping you identify birds. But if you want to know about their status um, in the state, uh, historically, um, this is really the, the best resource out there. It's, it's um, and it just came out, as I said, uh, last November, I think is the publication date. So highly recommend it. Um, uh, wonderful uh, uh, resource that we have now. So as we talk about changes in, in birds, I do think it's really important to um, go back. Uh, this was a paper that came out in the fall of 2019 um, that really uh, was one of the, the most comprehensive re uh, uh, reports that basically showed um, what's happened to our birds. Uh, unfortunately, we've lost about 3 billion birds um, since the 1970s, which, uh, and I, I should make the, the clear distinction that these are from the breeding bird population. So I'll use some, uh, we'll use some numbers in a little bit when we talk about like annual mortality rates and you'll see, um, especially when we're talking about billions, I feel like it's very hard to kind of 
almost wrap your head around it sometimes. Um, anyways, 3billionbirds.org is, is a website that was started to kind of help um, with a bit of the, the uh, spreading the word, getting the education out about this. Um, but it's really uh, uh, quite alarming, some of the findings. A lot of this was, was using um, a lot of uh, databases, citizen science, community science projects like breeding bird surveys, Christmas bird counts. Um, now more recently, we have things like eBird. So we'll use some of those resources as I go through tonight's talk. Um, but this is kind of a really good way to, to point out, um, at least in North America, what's happening uh, with some of our birds. So again, looking at the breeding population of birds, we know that uh, uh, in terms of the all birds that are out there, we'll break these down into some groups in a little bit. Um, we've lost about just under 3 billion birds since, since the 70s, um, which again, if you think about it from a, a complete population standpoint, it's about one in four, which is insane to think about. Um, some birds are doing better than others, and uh, at, and bear with me. In a, in a minute, we'll we'll kind of dive into you know specifically in Maine um, and look at some of these. But especially where uh, Maine has kind of a, a really good diversity of habitats and, and a really remarkable number of birds that come here. We have uh, over two hundred species of birds that breed in the state. A lot of them are migratory birds that are coming here from central wintering in Central and South America, coming all the way here to breed. Um, so it's a little unfortunate to see that things like our, you know, Baltimore Orioles, again, two and five, we've lost since the 70s, 28% um, uh, population decline in these migratory birds. Grassland birds are, are certainly not, not doing great. It's an interesting one to look at in Maine. We don't have a ton of grasslands, but the few that we do, especially farms, um, tend to be going away. So even here in Maine, uh, grassland birds, even though we don't have a, a ton of them, um, they're not faring well. Our boreal forest birds, um, Maine actually has one of the largest chunks of boreal forest for any state. Uh, most of it, you're, of course, go to Canada and that's, that's where you find the, the boreal forest, but um, Maine has kind of a, a big responsibility for the, the boreal birds in, in terms of the, the states here. And, and we're unfortunately seeing them uh, not only declining, but retreating out of the state as they move northward. Um, and then just to say, yes, of, of course, Maine, are, Maine is going to make up a lot of the eastern forest birds. And then aerial insectivores are one um, that are just sharply declining. Now, I don't want this to be all super negative, so it's it's good to point out we will talk about a lot of the conservation success stories that are out there, um, or especially here in Maine. Um, but it's it's fun to look at this and see that some uh, families of birds are doing okay. Um, raptors, we'll talk about a, a couple tonight. Um, woodpeckers are an interesting one. Thanks to conservation work and, and especially um, uh, allowing more mature trees, um, they're doing quite well. And then waterfowl is a great example of um, uh, when you do things like conserve land and, and put bag limits on game species, um, they've been really well managed to the point that they've made huge population gains. Um, and a lot of that is thanks to Really, thanks to hunters, um, the the uh, federal duck stamp program has has uh, um, led to the purchase of of a remarkable amount of of wetlands and, of course, the uh, great conservation um, uh, that comes from that. So, one of the most alarming things that came out of this report that I, I feel like wasn't quite talked about enough, so I want to <laughs> touch on it here is that we know, so waterfowl had a nice population increase, um, less than 40% of, or excuse me, less than 50% of all the waterfowl species did have a, a good increase. So that's great. Fortunately, waterfowl, or, or excuse me, water birds, like our, our herons declined, 
a lot of the land birds. So think of things like those, those grassland birds would be in this group, shorebirds declining. And what really struck me is to see that our introduced, our, our non-native, um, mostly invasive species also had huge population change declines since the 70s, um, which we tend to think of them as, you know, always thriving and, and, and being everywhere, uh, displacing a lot of our natives. So like they're probably having a bad impact on, well, they are having a bad impact on some of our native nesting species, but um, to know that they're also not faring that well, probably points to some larger uh, problems that are out there, especially when we start thinking about, you know, uh, things like the food chain. We know that the number of insects is, is sharply declining and, and that's most likely what's affecting things like, um, you know, from our rock pigeons, our European starlings, um, even though they, they tend to nest just about everywhere, unfortunately, Starlings are taking over cavities that a lot of other, uh, especially secondary cavity nesters would be using in Maine. Um, uh, it's not helping. Now one invasive species uh, that we know is, is doing all right, uh, coming to a backyard near you um, is the Eurasian collared dove. Um, still quite rare in Maine, but uh, I'm gonna go through We'll do this fairly quickly. Um, let's look at some maps. Uh, and this is in a short time frame. We're going to go through, uh, I feel like now, the, the more I do this talk, it, it, it just makes me feel older and older, I guess. Because uh, I like to go, we're going to go through my lifetime. Uh, going back to 1988, when, uh, when I was born, where were Eurasian collar doves? And, and we're going to look at uh, eBird, eBird.org. It's a community science project run by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology that asks people to report what birds they see, when and where, and with how much effort. And then they can use that information to create uh, well, a lot of products. But one of the cool ones are, are maps like this. And now eBird does not date back. It, it was really only in the um, kind of earlier 2000s that eBird uh, well started and then really got popular just in the last 10 years. But people, you can go in, because it's a database, you can submit old sightings. And obviously people have been birding for a long time. This has really become the, um, the repository of almost all uh, uh, bird records, um, except for ones that use, use different uh, sampling methods. But so anyways, what we can see is at least, you know, even in the 80s, uh, all of this grayed out area just means that there were checklists submitted. So we have data from really all over. And now where we start to see these pinks and purples showing up are where Eurasian collar doves were reported. And so this, the, the varying shades of uh, pink to purple, I guess, is uh, frequency. So what percentage of the checklist included that species on it. So it's important to note that all the Eurasian collar doves, as the name implies, Eurasian, Eurasia, they're an old world species. They should not be here in really anywhere in North America, the New World, um, but they pretty much all came from a population in the West Indies. Um, forget exactly which island it was now, but it was basically a, a captive population that I believe was a hurricane that destroyed an aviary allowing these birds to escape. And then as they started spreading, they came up through um, the Keys to Florida. And we'll see, I know you're all uh, holding your breath to see this map, but um, we'll start in 1988. This will jump two years at a time. So uh, here we go. Uh, Doug is born, collar doves just starting to show up in the US. Uh, we'll move ahead. I'm going into elementary school, middle school high school, uh, into college, started working for Maine Audubon, I guess. Um, and, oh, sorry, I guess, uh, missing one somewhere. Uh, uh, so here we are, uh, uh, present day, just about this uh, cutoff in 2018. Um, to see that in, you know, just over 30 years, this species has now 
spread um, and really taken over the country. This is um, this is not good. Um, they they spread up the west coast and then are now kind of filling in towards the east. So uh, we do know they're they're coming. This was Maine's first record in May of 2013 when it showed up in Falmouth, actually right across the road from Maine Audubon's headquarters uh, in Falmouth Hills on Farm. So. Kind of, you know, nice that it didn't show up on our property. Um, but of course, as crazy birders, we all ran over to see it. Um, and then uh, uh, just a couple years ago, 2019, um, one showed up out on Monhegan Island, a uh, popular birding site for, for folks. Um, and interestingly, that bird hung around for weeks. And as you can see in this picture, it's it's inflating its... Uh, uh, its throat here, it was singing a lot. So that was a bird with, with breeding on its mind. Um, so we'll talk a lot about breeding birds here as, as Bill teased at the beginning and they're gonna try to be slipping in a lot about the main bird atlas, which is all about um, documenting breeding birds in the state. Um, so it's good that we don't have Eurasian collar doves here yet. They'll probably outcompete uh, some of our native species. They'll certainly take resources. Um, and interestingly, there, there's a big spread of um, uh, apparently an increase in Cooper's hawk populations anywhere that these birds go. Uh, you can think of doves as just one of the, the best food sources out there. They've got a lot of, um, doves are really strong flyers. This is kind of why you know people love, um, unfortunately, things like passenger pigeons were such a good meal because Doves and pigeons um, tend to have really big uh, um, breast muscles, which makes for good eating. So if you're a Cooper's hawk, here's an abundant food source now. And, and unfortunately with more Cooper's hawks, they'll start um, going after our birds as well. It is worth mentioning. Um, so Eurasian collar doves are, you know, they were ke kept in captivity have escaped and now spread and are super common. We actually get a lot of reports of escaped birds in Maine, which is, is kind of funny to, to think about. Um, a little unfortunate that these are basically pets that, that escape, but um, you know, every now and then we get reports of you know, folks who think that they have a Eurasian collar dove. Um, this was a bird that was in South Portland a few years ago, October, 2017. Um, I went, uh, I hung out in their backyard. Um, and sure enough, you can see it's, uh, they look a little different. They're very similar birds. Um, but this is actually, uh, the species is African collared dove. Um, but it, the, the more, the colloquial name that they're usually known as is the uh, turtle dove, ringed turtle dove. So this was someone's pet. You can even see it's got a band on its leg. So hopefully it, uh, eventually it gets uh, reconnected with its, with its owner. Now why, I, this seems like a funny group of birds to, to be talking about, but when we think about Maine's history, it's kind of a fun one to look at other birds that have funny origins. Um, house finches, which especially in, in Southern Maine, I know most people in the chat said that they were uh, in York County, which is York County Audubon talk. Um, house finches have a, a uh, very interesting history in Maine, uh, especially the Northeast. They were introduced here. They are essentially a non-native species. They're native to North America, but house finches um, were first introduced in New York in 1939. Uh, so before that, you could you would walk into a store and you could buy a house finch. They were called Hollywood finches um, because they came from places like California. Um, unfortunately, uh, uh, through that introduction in, in New York in uh, 1939, they then started to spread. Um, they're not quite as, they're, they're, they're really not invasive, so we don't quite talk about them the same way that we do with things like house sparrows. Good to make that distinction. House sparrows are the other um, European non-native species that, that were um, also first introduced in New York. The second place house sparrows were introduced in the US was actually Portland, Maine, which is a funny uh, bit of trivia. Um, but anyways, house finches, 
native to North America, not native to New England or the Northeast, New York. Um, they spread here and first showed up in Maine in 1966. Uh, actually in Cape Nettick was the uh, first place that they were found. Um, so a, a little insert uh, in that Peter Vickery's book, Birds of Maine that came out last year. Um, this is why you should buy it. There's some awesome uh, things like these maps that they put together to kind of show some of these changes. So here's house finches and kind of a, a, a couple of nice snapshots of how they've expanded. Um, and worth noting, so this is showing in, in 66 to 72, that's kind of where they, uh, again, in Cape Nettick, where they were first found, I guess, down here, and then started breeding kind of through coastal York um, and Southern, Southern, uh, Southern Cumberland County, excuse me, um, from 78 to 83, we'll talk about this, um, the Atlas of Breeding Birds of Maine. Uh, so they had really expanded quite a bit since then. And now this is just showing in the 2010s in from May to July, which is their breeding season. Uh, again, how they continue to expand. Um, and again, that is just the, the breeding season. You can see them um, certainly even further north from there. And that's a fun segue uh, to a species that's now incredibly common uh, through especially Southern Maine, uh, the Southern half of the state, um, Northern Cardinals. But it's a fun one to point out again in this, <laughs> using the funny segue of um, introduced or, or non-native species where Cardinals not that long ago were not here. So going back to Ralph Palmer's uh, Birds of Maine from 1949, at that time, so 1949, not that long ago, he wrote that there were a couple records of cardinals in Maine, but his, he presumed that they were all more likely to be escaped pets, which again, like cardinal, beautiful, you know, bright red bird, they have a wonderful song. Um, people used to keep them as pets, um, unfortunately. But, uh, yeah, even in 1949, Palmer was saying that there, that Maine's records were more likely escaped pets than uh, naturally occurring vagrants because it was just a, a more Southern species at that time. It only took 20 years after that. And we'll see uh, 1949, there, there's some funny changes that really started happening, especially in the 50s when we start talking about climate change in a little bit. Um, where a number of species started expanding their ranges northward. And by 1969, we had northern cardinals now breeding in the state. So not just, you know, uh, vagrants showing up, but here established uh, as breeders. Which is a nice segue to uh, talk about the Maine Bird Atlas. Um, the Maine Bird Atlas is a project by being run by the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. Um, I always love pointing this out because uh, uh, so many people associate IFNW with especially game species, you know, a lot of hunting activities, fishing, um, but they are here to protect all of Maine's uh, wildlife. And this is, a, I think, an especially uh, great way of them kind of putting their money where their mouth is, if we wanted to put it that way, um, but doing a, a very important project to, um, work with essentially all birds, all species of birds that are in the state of Maine. So I, um, one of the many hats I wear, uh, uh, through Maine Audubon, we were hired to do the um, outreach for the, for the Atlas. So here I am uh, reaching out to you all uh, about it. So it's a five-year project. It started in 2018. Um, and we're basically trying to document what birds are breeding and wintering, but we'll focus on the breeding portion um, for tonight. What birds are, are breeding across the state? And so we'll, we'll look at some of those maps in a second. I mentioned this with the house finch when we saw that map. Um, 
from 1978 to 83 was the first time that a, a breeding atlas had been done in the state. There were 201 species confirmed at the time, um, and 14 of those had not previously been documented in the state. So really cool effort. Um, and it's fun to now be able to look at their results, look at the results that we're seeing now. There are these two you know, really good snapshots in time and see some of the changes that, that are occurring. Um, we still have a couple of years left in our atlas, so I'll make a plug towards the end here. Um, but it's fun to look at some of these maps and see some of the changes. Like cardinals by, again, 78 to 83, to think that they had just started breeding in Maine in 1969, you can see what a rapid expansion they did, especially in kind of uh, suburban areas. Now here's our current map. Um, sorry, Mike, uh, there should be a key on here that has apparently gone away, but um, uh, a little different from the frequency maps that we saw before. Um, the darkest shades of purple, almost black, is where they are confirmed breeding. Uh, the, the true purple, we want to call it that, are probable records. Lighter shade is possible. And then these pinks are just where they've only been observed. So um, a really fun thing. This is a little teaser. You're the first people that get to see this. If you come to a, a talk tomorrow that I'll plug, um, this is some of the, the final maps that we're gonna be producing. Again, preliminary, this is only two years, or excuse me, three years worth of data, um, but we're being able to produce some really cool maps showing the change. Um, you can see quite a, a bit of change. Um, and for the first time we can actually, we'll have density maps for the, the state of Maine. So really get to see where these species are. So Northern Cardinals, nice increase in them. Another species that's uh, benefiting quite well, as I mentioned earlier, uh, with especially thanks to Maine Audubon's uh, seabird crew out there, piping plovers are going through just uh, kind of having wonderful nesting success lately, uh, breaking records literally every year. So um, last year we were just shy, I think it was 199 chicks that were fledged off Maine beaches um, coming from just under 100 pairs in the state. So this is wonderful to see, um, especially after there had been this, this little dip. There was really high predation um, back in the early 2000s. There's uh, especially a lot of things like skunks, raccoons, um, foxes that are showing up at beaches and, and um, becoming quite a problem. But through using things like exclosures, even some electric fences in areas, um, uh, getting better control, um, unfortunately, this number can probably only go so high. And so here, the entire state of Maine, here's the key I wanted to show you before. If we look at the Maine Bird Atlas results for piping plovers, these, uh, and I should mention, uh, the state's broken up into about 4,080 blocks. And those blocks are the, they're, they're three by three miles. Um, and that's kind of the, the survey size that we're using for the atlas. So to think that our entire population of piping plovers are just in this tiny area, a lot of it in York County. Um, glad that they're um, having such success, but they've, uh, they're gonna have some, some problems at some point. Um, again, the, the, the issue is they only nest on sandy beaches and Maine has a very, uh, bold coast, if you don't mind um, stealing that phrase from, from down east Maine. We tend to have a lot of rocky, uh, rocky beaches. They like sand. One of the greatest conservation success stories in Maine, um, some people would argue it's too much of a success, uh, is our wild turkey. Um, now, almost everywhere you go, you can find these adorable little poults in the summer and into the fall. Um, Polt is the name of the, the chicks. And fun to look at it. Again, 1978 to 83, here's where they were. Uh, I got the date already. Um, it was not that long before this atlas, the first atlas, that wild turkeys were extirpated from the state. They had actually been overhunted. There was no regulation on things like bag limits. And, and it's hard to think that you could just hunt a, a species to, to 
local extinction. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if it probably also had to do with things like the habitat changing, maybe even disease at some point. But the state uh, decided to reintroduce turkeys. They went to Vermont, caught turkeys, reintroduced them here. And you can see basically in York County and then in the mid coast area where these little black dots are, that's the only places that wild turkeys were confirmed breeding again from 78 to 83. Now, look at them, they're everywhere. They're literally in every single county, how they've made it up over some of these, uh, especially the, the mountain ranges to end up in um, Piscataquis County is, is remarkable. Um, so, wow, what a, a great success for them. Um, another remarkable success in the, the state of Maine is just um, bald eagles, uh, especially, you know, Charlie Todd at, at Maine IFNW has, has done so much. Um, his aerial surveys have, have really helped fill in um, some of the maps for our results. It's a fun one, again, looking just how they've changed in the last few decades. Um, really, you know, mostly down east before, only a few inland, but now look at all across the state and remarkably inland, um, they're now confirmed breeding all over. Um, to the point that they're actually becoming a bit of a problem um, because there's a lot of other species that nest uh, <laughs> where these eagles are as well. Um, actually, I just realized it looks like there's a band on in that one. Um, anyway, so for things like cormorants, uh, specifically our great cormorant, uh, there are two species of cormorants that nest in the state of Maine. Um, we have our slightly smaller, very common double crested cormorants, which are just starting to arrive back. I just saw my first ones of the year about a week or two ago. Um, great cormorants will, will spend the winters in Maine. And we're on the southern edge of their breeding range. And so where you're on the edges, where they, you know, populations tend not to, to do so well, but especially when you have things like eagles that love picking cormorant chicks out of their nest, um, it's really causing quite a, a problem. Um, this is a younger one. Uh, that's why it's got the white belly. That's not um, usually white in the throat, yellow on the what we call the guler pouch uh, versus the burnt orange color here. Um, but anyways, they're down to about two islands uh, that our great cormorants are, are still nesting on, which is really not good. Uh, peregrine falcons, uh, as we mentioned, you know, uh, uh, so we can lump kind of with the, the bald eagles having great comeback, uh, peregrine falcons as well, ospreys as well. Um, a lot of that is because of how low their populations were before. It was, uh, was that 60s into the 70s when DDT was being so uh, widely used. Um, uh, the insecticide that through bioaccumulation caused the thinning of eggshells in a lot of our, our raptors um, and really unfortunately wiped them out. So good thing we're not using DDT anymore. I think the U.S. still exports it, which is an absolute disgrace, um, but it can't be used here and we're seeing our uh, birds benefiting from it. Uh, so now we've got peregrine falcons nesting, you know, <laughs> certainly not as, as dense. They have very specific habitat requirements. They like uh, rocky cliffs and things, but um, now quite a few of them breeding in the state. It's worth mentioning that some birds have not really uh, come back from things like the, the era of DDT. Um, logger head shrikes are a species that used to breed in the Northeast. Not to be confused with our northern shrikes. Northern shrikes are uh, more northern nesting species that do come south to Maine in the winter. Um, but we used to have loggerhead shrikes that would breed in the state. So here's from, uh, again, the, the older birds of Maine um, where, uh, you know, they were listed in Androscoggin as a you know, rare summer resident. Um, where was it here? Uh, Washington, New York, a rare migrant. Um, 
Yeah, this is what drives me nuts. You know, Westbrook Gorham, um, I guess only seeing in the fall, but they, anyways, I lost my notes here, but they were, they were nesting in the state. And now we haven't had one in the last, they're not even being seen at all, really. I think only like one or two records in the last decade, um, but no breeding. It makes me kind of wonder what are we going to lose next? Um, unfortunately, I think it's going to be one of my favorite birds. This is uh, called salt marsh sparrow. They nest, as the name implies, in our salt marshes. Um, when I was working at the Scarborough Marsh years ago, um, I used to help with this, uh, uh, this demographic study. Um, so for, for three years, uh, we, we'd go out super early, set up nets, try to catch the birds. So you can see it's got these bands on it. Um, unique markers and we would do things like find nests, take blood samples, etc. Um, it's worth noting we have salt marsh sparrows and Nelson sparrows. So Nelson sparrows do also breed in, in the same habitats, so they're even hybridizing, um, but Nelsons also have some interior populations across uh, North America. So um, even though we, we don't want to lose them here in Maine, um, the fact that salt marsh sparrows are only in salt marshes is, is What's not going to help? It's especially bad because they nest, they make these cup nests low in the marsh that get flooded during high tides. So they have to, um, and I should say during the, the astronomical or um, uh, what is the word for that? The, the spring high tide, the highest high tide of each month uh, will literally flood their nests. Uh, so they have to nest between high tide cycles, um, which is a very short window. And unfortunately, it's getting shorter because of sea level rise. Um, it, it is a, a more complicated thing than that. It's, it's not only sea level rise, but um, the barriers we've now put through salt marshes. So roads, um, bridges are not adequate, uh, uh, culverts are not large enough. Um, it's unfortunately all compounding to be quite a problem. So since the 1990s, not that long ago, uh, their population has declined about 75%. Um, so the current estimate, their entire population is around 9% lost annually. Um, Maine's actually even a little bit higher than that. Um, and it's terrible. Uh, there, there's some predictions that by 2050, which is, right around the corner um, that by 2050, uh, we could lose these birds. Back on a more positive note, woodpeckers. Um, oh, sorry, if any, I'm in to mute this video. Woodpeckers are doing great. Uh, as a hairy woodpecker, red-bellied woodpecker is a fun example of a species that, um, you know, again, kind of new to Maine. Uh, you look at even field guides from like the, the 80s and they weren't here they were barely in new england now this video is from uh from gills and farm just a couple of years ago we've got them breeding here on loop it's not a <laughs> constant feeding trips um but yeah here we are again in the 80s they were barely in new england not at all reported during the first breeding atlas in the state but now um here's our key uh now we've got them breeding all the way up you know just north of, of Waterville, uh, remarkable range expansion we've gone through. It's fun to look at nearby states who have also completed atlases. Again, it's by completing that second atlas that you can do things like compare and get these wonderful you know, changes that have occurred. So interesting to see that also across Mass, uh, almost every single block that had, uh, had them breeding in the second atlas, only a couple blocks to, did they have them in their first atlas. Uh, I hope I don't need to convince anyone in this audience that climate change is a real thing, but red-bellied woodpeckers in your backyard now breeding here in Maine is the perfect example. <clears throat> and there's this wonderful study that uh, looked at red-bellied woodpeckers and showed that they followed what's called Bergman's rule. So it's this eco-geographical principle that says across a species range, the further you go from the equator, the more mass that species will have. So the red-bellied woodpeckers down here in Florida were a little bit smaller, maybe not actually in length as I tried to illustrate here, 
um, if you can see that, uh, but certainly mass, they, they were, they weighed less. Um, because if it's warmer, you don't need as much mass to survive. So 1950, again, kind of the time that we know CO2 is being dumped in really high uh, uh, quantities, especially through industrialization. Um, what the study did was look at red-bellied woodpeckers in their distribution between nine, before 1950 by going into things like museum collections, um, any records of like banded birds, and found this nice distribution of less mass, more mass. They did this study in 2010, did the same thing, asked people who were you know, banding birds, um, anyone who could take measurements for them, and then looked at how is that spread of the red-bellied woodpeckers um, broken up as well. And what they found were that in places like Maine, uh, New England, uh, we had the red-bellied woodpeckers with more mass, again, helps to survive. Uh, you know, maybe that's why Mainers, we tend to be a little bit heftier than some of those uh, people down South. But more interestingly, in some place like New Jersey, they found that the red-bellied woodpeckers that were there in 1950 had more mass than the ones that are there now. Now, the only way that you can have the same species occurring in the same area, but with less mass over time, is if the climate has gotten warmer there. So red-bellied woodpecker is a great example of, of this. Um, uh, Carolina wren is another species that we know is expanding the strange northward because of climate change. This is looking at Christmas bird count data. So you probably hear about usually in late December, um, York County helps host a, a couple counts in the state. Um, Carolina wrens are, are one that, that tends to be reported a lot. This year we had a record number uh, of them reported. It's been, we've had a few mild winters, but what's interesting is that we're on the Northern edge of their range. They're more Southern species and every now and then they get knocked back. So this, um, what was this, the winter of 20, I think it was the 2013 into 14. Pardon me, I, I, too many dates. Um, we had a really bad, cold, and incredibly deep snowed winter. Uh, if folks remember, uh, uh, this was in, I think, February, where we had back to back to back nor'easters that each dropped literally feet of snow. Um, and that made things like, especially food, too hard to find for, for these birds. So you can see it really knocked back their northern population. And then Eastern bluebirds are another one that are just kind of, uh, uh, while we've known them for a long time to be breeders in the state, uh, they're now overwintering in really large numbers. Um, again, kind of a more recent phenomenon. This is just looking at Christmas bird count data. And I should make the point, this is, I've been showing raw numbers because it'll make more sense to us. Um, but if you, a better measure would have been birds per party hour just to make sure that it's not just biased by the amount of uh, effort, the amount of people or time that goes into it. Uh, I know it'd be easy to look at this and say like, oh, birding's become much more popular in the last 20 years. Like there's just more people seeing them. But if you divide the number of birds by the amount of effort, it follows the exact same path. So looking at birds per party hour would help. Um, take care of that and trust me the the same pattern is there. Um, but it's, I think it's a lot easier for us to, to visualize or conceptualize 617 uh, Eastern bluebirds in Maine last winter versus me saying like, oh, uh, 2.567 uh, birds per party hour. Uh, one of the uh, uh, last examples I'll, I'll just show, um, we still think of red-winged blackbirds as kind of a, a migrant, a true herald of spring, um, but they're changing. Uh, again, with, with climate change, what we're seeing is they're starting to arrive earlier. This is one of the messiest charts I've ever made, and uh, I'm, I'm, I wanted to show it here because this is just a great example of like, something we're actually seeing changing. And you can kind of see with, with varying years, they're showing up earlier and earlier. Again, this is frequency. Um, what percentage of checklists are they reported on? Um, certainly some years, uh, you know, it, it, it 
sways a little um, back and forth, but if you can uh, uh, hopefully not go blind looking at this, here's the trend. Um, this is going back, you know, 1999. Um, you can see some of the first arrivals were kind of by mid March. Um, every now and then we get these weird, you know, not great data going back this far. So these weird spikes, but there's clearly this trend of some of the first arrivals um, going from mid-March in 2000, in the early 2000s to, you know, early March. Um, you can really see, you know, almost this, you could draw a line here. And as soon as I do uh, a little more statistics homework or something, I'll, I'll make a better chart for you guys. Um, but to see that 2020, last year, was the first year that we had red-winged blackbirds reported every single week of the year somewhere in the state of Maine um, versus you know these larger gaps, if not months at a time. So it's changing. With the last uh, uh, minute or so here, um, I just wanna make a few recommendations of what are some things you can do to help Birds. We've, we've, we've covered a lot, um, wins and losses, um, but there's some kind of very simple things that we all can do, either as consumers, as conservationists, as uh, whatever level uh, uh, of a bird appreciator you are, um, there's things that you can do. One very important thing, um, we didn't talk a lot about birds outside of what they're doing outside of Maine, here, but um, for so many of these species that are coming to Maine to breed, if we think back of one of those first charts I showed are um, the migratory species that we've lost, I think it was 28% of their population. Um, a lot of those are going to spend the winters in, and I should say neotropic migrants. So spending the winters in uh, Central America, Northern part of South America, maybe the West Indies, um, which tends to be where a lot of our coffee comes from. So if you are a coffee drinker, the best thing that you can do, um, at least from a, uh, 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 um, what's the word, not economic, but from a um, financial contribution side, I guess I'll say, as a consumer, the, the best thing that you can do is switch to being, to drinking, shade grown coffee, which is grown in uh, essentially good bird habitat rather than uh, places that are just cleared uh, so that the coffee grows faster and can meet our demand. So look for this bird friendly Smithsonian certification um, and do a little more research if you're, if you're really curious about it. For the sake of time, I'm gonna keep clicking. Uh, Planting native plants and avoiding pesticide use uh, is, is really critical. As we saw, um, a lot of those declines are probably connected with a lack of food that's around. And that important food for a lot of our nesting birds are things like caterpillars, a lot of the insects, the lepidopter larva, the, the caterpillars of moths, butterflies. And what they need is native plants. That is the bottom of the food chain. Uh, native plants feed those native insects which gives us our next generation of baby birds keep your cats indoors uh bill beat me to the the punch earlier um the thing about this is there's so many things that we can do um we can plant natives we can buy shade grown coffee we can um you know, put stickers on our windows to, to cut back on declines, but it's 2.4 billion birds per year in the U.S. that are killed by outdoor cats. And a lot of those are also just owned cats. These are not just feral cats. These are outdoor owned cats. They are surplus killers, so it doesn't matter if you feed them. They're still going to kill birds when they can. And just to compare, like this is insane to see if you try to, you know, pick your battles. Um, cats are by far the number one worst thing out there. Um, if you own a cat, please keep it indoors. 
they are a non-native uh, pet that we brought from the, the Fertile Crescent back in the day because they were so good at killing mice that were eating our, basically when we started uh, uh, our wonderful history with agriculture and started growing plants, or, or excuse me, cultivating plants and, and trying to store food, uh, rodents started eating our food and we noticed that cats would eat the rodents. So then as we started spreading, uh, uh, especially through ports around the world, we brought cats with us and we humans have introduced cats all over the world, bringing this apex predator with us. There's no reason that we should um, allow this billions of birds to be killed annually. Again, that is contributing to the loss of uh, that, that uh, 3 billion number are those breeding birds. So to think that we're pulling out this huge chunk annually that's going just being killed just by cats um, is ridiculous. Become a community scientist. Uh, so we've been looking at things like eBird. If you say uh, birds are really not that you know, for me, um, there are great projects like iNaturalist. There's all sorts of ways to be involved. Uh, I want to make the final plug. We've, we've uh, hopefully just sprinkled in uh, things about the Atlas. Um, one of the most important things for getting the Atlas done is having lots of coverage, good statewide coverage. Um, right now, we know that we're doing a good job with uh, finding out where birds are, where people are. So here's our, our effort map right now that the darkest blocks are what we would call complete. We need about 20 hours of effort in a block for it to be considered complete. We know we won't get the entire state done, but we've identified what we call priority blocks. And if I can just pick on York County for a second, since I know that's where most people are. Well, maybe I apologize if it's hard to see on your screen, but where uh, some of these blocks have a little um, border around them, those are priority blocks. So everyone's done a great job kind of, you know, here's Scarborough Marsh somewhere up here. We're doing a great job along the coast, but there are a ton of these interior priority blocks in York County that are not getting touched. And to think that York County has the second largest population in the state, um, we need people to leave, you know, go away from your, uh, you know, we all have our favorite places to go birding, but the success of this project, we, we need good statewide coverage um, in these priority blocks. And just 20 hours worth of effort uh, over the next couple of years, it'll add up quickly. So check out, um, actually tomorrow night, we will record these. So if you can't make it, uh, you can always watch them. But we're doing a, our 2021 season kickoff meeting uh, in, we'll be wrapping up in 24 hours, uh, but go on maine.gov slash bird atlas. Uh, you can register right here. It is, it is free, but just to get the link, that's how you'll do it. Um, and this will be fun. We're going to have, uh, we'll do a little intro and then have beginner, intermediate, and uh, uh, expert breakout sessions. So even if you're brand new to it, you just are thinking like, wow, I kind of want to know what Doug was rambling about so quickly in that little uh, uh, time that he had. Um, join us tomorrow or, or again, watch this later on. And then every week after that, we'll be doing uh, uh, Zoom sessions on, or Q&A sessions on Zoom. So you can always get involved and join in and find out uh, ways to help with that project. With that, thank you so much. Um, I will stop screen sharing. Uh, I saw, I haven't been able to look at them, but it looks like a couple questions might've popped up. Um, Be right with you, Doug. Yeah, um, and sorry if I didn't fully uh, ex ex and just say um, thank you, everyone, for for uh, listening to me <laughs> get so much out in, in in the last hour. I'm very appreciative of uh, your county Audubon also asking me to uh, do this talk. Um, obviously, something I'm I'm passionate about and always want to do whatever I can to help people realize the the value. Um, 
that birds provide to us in, in kind of all sorts of different ways. And I think we, we owe it to them um, to, uh, to give back. And, and the main bird Alice is going to, um, if I didn't get this point across before, a lot of the, the conservation decisions for Maine birds will be decided from the results of that. We'll, we'll use that to say like, oh my gosh, look at aerial insectivores have declined this much in the state. Like, let's do something about it. Kestrels, how are they doing? Um, so we need to, we need this to be a, a success so that we have good data to make those decisions. What, what can we do about kestrels? Put up boxes. Um, unfortunately, you know, the uh, kestrels are secondary cavity nesters. So they like nesting in holes that are made by other species. Um, so woodpeckers, especially. We think of woodpeckers as primary cavity nesters. They've got the beaks to, to make those holes. Um, a woodpecker will nest one year and then essentially, um, sometimes they come back, but most years they're, they're gonna make a new cavity every year. So this, there's this whole suite of secondary cavity nesters that then move in, um, kestrels being one of them. Um, and so instead of waiting for a woodpecker to come in and you know make a, uh, cavity and then maybe in a future year Kestrel could use it. Um, putting up a large, uh, they usually use the same size box as like a wood duck box is what a lot of people will find online. Um, and you can even, you know, try reaching out uh, uh, in the, the towns you live in. Um, there's a lot of areas that uh, uh, people are trying to just install uh, Kestrel boxes along telephone poles, um, which are Kind of a, a wonderful, um, uh, I almost said naturally occurring. Um, they, they're natural in that humans put them all along roads, which tend to be near large open right. areas where kestrels nest. But um, that would be a, a great thing to do to help. Yeah, that sounds like a good project for us. Uh, we have a few questions. Uh, one person, uh, Gina Stevens, asking about woodcock in Maine. Um, what's the distribution? Are they pretty much throughout the entire state or? Yeah, um, so it's funny. I have, I almost put the, a, a map for them in here um, because I've been showing off lately with, with the Atlas as a great example of, um, uh, I briefly mentioned there, there's possible, probable, and confirmed codes for the atlas. Um, woodcocks are really hard to confirm as breeders because you usually have to find either their nest or their young. But one of the best things uh, that we can do with, with woodcocks is get a probable code, which is when you, you know, go out in the evening and you hear them doing their aerial displays, painting on the ground, which is singing, but then displaying up in the air. And they're actually all over the state. And the best example of this is um, uh, um, forgetting, uh, oh my gosh. Um, so uh, Jeff Cherry and um, what's her name, Kathy. Um, we've got two volunteers in the Mid Coast area who are basically taking it upon themselves to, con to get a probable woodcock record in every single block near them. And it's, if you look at the Woodcock map, it's just this giant swath of purple because they have been going out every evening. You basically just have to find a um, kind of a, a open field. If it's a little wet, that helps. And if it's got some woods on the border, so the, they'll tend to nest in the woods, but they'll come out in the fields because they're lacking species. So they'll do their display while the females are watching. Um, but that example of uh, those two volunteers, basically they they found in every single block in Lincoln County, I think now, maybe there's a couple they're missing, but they're everywhere. Uh, they're so much more abundant than I think we, we realize. Another question about, uh, well, specifically about woodpeckers, but about species and bird species in general, uh, the impact of the uh, emerald ash borer on uh, uh, boreal species and others? Yeah, um, so uh, uh, I'll say the, the, the best answer I'll give is I don't know um, that connection. 
I've, I've never heard of a connection with Emerald Dash Borers to the success of um, Woodpeckers coming back. Uh, the way I've heard it is that it's, it's mostly thanks to kind of uh, changes in forestry practices. So especially the way that we, we don't do clear cutting uh, like we used to, um, you know, when you think about like the fact that there's virtually no virgin forest left, you know, in the state of Maine, like we were, it was cut over. Um, and so, and that's true for a lot of areas. So um, uh, I've always heard the success of woodpeckers mostly because of the, the changes in some of, some of our forestry practices. Uh, and ash borers are killing a lot of trees, woodpeckers like, dead trees that you know have uh, uh, boring insects. So I bet there's there's probably a little correlation, but um, it'd be a fun one to look at. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. What, could you elaborate a little on the specific uses that the bird atlas results can be, will be put to? I mean, obviously you'll identify would be uh, areas where it's important, more important to uh, protect land through LMF, for example? Yeah, um, uh, so the best answer is, you know, the, the interesting thing will be, what does this uncover? Um, so, you know, we have already in the state, uh, you know, IFNW is in charge of keeping track of what species are listed so you know who's endangered who's threatened um then there are the species of special concern um so most likely like the the what i'll bet not and and i'll quickly admit you know as the outreach coordinator uh my involvement you know will be uh, a little different than um some of the biologists that will be that would be brought in to make some of these decisions but what will most likely happen is that with our results, when we can show that things like um, a lot of our, our swallows, especially um, uh, bank and cliff swallows are just disappearing. Um, especially when you look at, they were everywhere. They were all over the place in the first atlas. Now there's a few places that they're still nesting. Um, step one will be elevating those things to either species of, of concern, getting them actually listed as, as threatened um, could actually, would be a good way to then help. Um, uh, you, you never want a species to be listed is, is maybe an important thing. That's kind of uh, a bit of a last, last resort, but um, then that, that's what really helps kind of get the attention. Um, so when you start thinking about things like the amount of funding, which of course is a finite resource, um, if we can say like, we're, we're going to lose this species unless something is done, um, uh, this will be kind of some of the, the results to it. Again, I hope right. it's not that dire, <laughs> um, right. but, uh, how many species are listed as endangered and threatened in Maine now? And what's the, how long does it take for what's the process for a bird to get added to that status? Um, so right now, uh, I don't know the actual number off the top of my head, but I'll, you know, if, if there's um, probably around 30 or less uh, total species of birds <clears throat> that are both um, some combination of uh, threatened or endangered. Um, a lot of those are a lot of our seabirds. Um, so we mentioned, uh, uh, <laughs> what did I mention? Um, but some of the things like razor bills are listed, um, which are just, you know, not, not common breeders. Um, yeah, the great cormorant, um, black crown night herons are listed species. Some of our terns, especially roseate, least terns, the piping plovers are the ones that we mentioned. Um, uh, there are some kind of odd species that are, are listed in Maine. Um, I believe American pipit is, it's because uh, they, there's only one known nesting site uh, up on Mount Katahdin. It's the only uh, 
kind of proper habitat for them. So very important to preserve that. Um, <clears throat> and I'll quickly admit, I don't know the full process. You usually have to show, uh, uh, there's, there's, there's a metric that basically looks at what the decline is kind of over, I think it's over a certain time frame. So like, as I showed the, the salt marsh sparrow is an interesting example of like, they, um, they haven't been listed yet on the state level, but I think they, they were about to be listed on the federal level. But if you think about the, the last four years of um, environmental protection work in the, the US, there's not a lot of effort to get species listed. Um, hopefully uh, we'll be making some more progress on that. Right. Well, thank you very much for your presentation tonight. Uh, thank you to everyone for joining us. Hope you can join us next month and also uh, check out uh, the Bird Atlas launch program tomorrow night, uh, which will also be available for subsequent streaming uh, through the main.gov Bird Atlas location. Uh, so thank you very much. Hope you all can get out birding soon and enjoy the migrants that are streaming our way. And so good night, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Good night.